It's time to pull those belts tight, race fans. The Front Stretch is coming at you. Presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Now, here's Dan Taylor and Dirk Houston. Well, good morning to you, race fans, and welcome to the Front Stretch, presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. As always, online at joeskarting.com. Fast-paced, white-knuckle racing just across the river, and it is indoor karting. So soon, maybe soon, we'll see. Temperatures seem to be staying in the 60s and 50s for the highs throughout the week. So eventually, the temperature is going to get down to where you're going to definitely enjoy that heated indoor karting facility at Joe's Karting on 23rd Avenue in Council Bluffs. There is still time to get registered for the Hammerhead drawing and for all the stuff they have going on. Get down to Joe's Karting today, 23rd Avenue in Council Bluffs, or online, joeskarting.com. Let's talk about the show coming up today. We've got a big one for you. Turn number one, we'll recap Texas, the rain-shortened Texas. Then in turn number two, we're going to talk to a guy who has been a staple in the dirt racing community. You may not have seen him, but oh, you've, you've seen him. Oh, you've probably seen him. You just, you just don't know. You just don't know him. you've seen him. He's down in the corners and along the front stretches uh, with his camera, and Joe Orth's going to join us to talk about his his time as a, as a photographer, a crewman, how he got started. You know, we kind of do that whole, let's figure out how you got started in it, how it involved in such an addiction. And then uh, we'll also talk about the struggles of being a photographer in the Instagram world. And the spirit of the week with having uh, the Marines birthday and uh, Veterans Day all in this one week, we yeah. did speak a little bit about his military service. Uh, we recorded on Thursday, which was the Marines birthday, like you just said, and then Veterans Day on Friday. So as it's Sunday, we can't say it enough throughout the country. We thank you to every one of you. Absolutely. That uh, that served uh we do appreciate your service it's it's such a selfless act and uh, and thank you thank you thank you we can't say it enough in turn number two we're going to talk to ralph woodard from uncle frank's now they do chassis for uh dirt oval cart racing right go-kart racing the cage carts the open carts uh anything uh a to z in the go-kart world and uh, we'll talk to him about that. And then at turn number four, we will preview the second to last race in the NASCAR 2016 season. It's all about to wrap up. Who will be champion? I have no idea. I have no clue. I mean, I would like to think that I would I would bet my money on Jimmy Johnson, but I have no clue. Well, it's it's going to be interesting. The big X factor with Jimmy Johnson is I don't think he has been to Homestead where he had to race to win the championship. Right. That was the big conversation after he won at Te- after he won at Martinsville. He's now locked into Homestead, so he'll be one of the four. And we know now with the results of Texas, Carl will be the second of four. And and Jimmy has never gone to Homestead needing to push. He's always had to protect. And finish, Maybe finish was, in twentieth yeah. or finish twenty fourth, and so he goes and he finds a spot between eighteenth and twentieth, and he got a hundred car lengths in front of him and a hundred car lengths behind him, and he runs around the track. It'll be very interesting because he's a hot hand right now, but then you can't turn away from Carl Edwards. Though he hasn't been as hot, I think he's going to carry that momentum of Joe Gibbs Racing, and he'll be very competitive next Sunday at Homestead. And who's going to win today? It's well, it's we, a it's a big question mark. When we were doing the lead in for Texas, you know we. We figured Carl was going to be one of the guys to beat Yeah. when he qualified ninth. And, again, he probably didn't have the dominant car, but he was in the lead when he needed to be. And for really one of the first times this whole year, Arrow seemed to really be yeah. huge at the front. Yep. And it hasn't been that way all year. It's really weird because they're running the same package that they've run at these other tracks. Was it the colder conditions Very well mixed been. in with the cars expecting to have – uh, they were expecting the cars to be more loose because it was expected, obviously, to be a green flag that afternoon. With the heat on the track, the temperatures of the track would have been up, so the cars would have been more loose. So these cars were tightened up a lot. Well, within the with the six hours of pre-race coverage we had, <laughs> because of the rain, if you listened, every single crew chief, we, crew chief said we put a lot of adjustment in the cars, possibly you know anticipating the weather mm-hmm. problem. Mm-hmm. But like Joey Logano was very fast and dominant car the first half of the race. And as he kept saying, I'm way too tight. I can't go anywhere. Yeah. And they just kept working on it, working on it. And I mean, he dropped back to what I think he was running their 10th or 12th there for a, for a mm-hmm. long time. Well, but as, as they got him as, back up. As soon as he lost that lead, you talked about it. When he lost the clean air advantage, that arrow, his car plummeted. I mean, yeah. I mean, he didn't drop outside the top 20, but he definitely wasn't that strong car that was three, four seconds in front of the field. Oh, yeah. I mean, if they would have had like three green flag pits stops instead of one there'd have probably only been five cars on the lead lap yeah. he was just mowing it down and was very fast and wasn't hurting the tires you saw a few guys beating their tires up 
But a couple uh, of them quartered them and, and zipped them yep. off. When, when they talk about that zipping, it's it's where a, a little chunk of the tire comes off, and then the tire just begins to unravel. And, yeah, it, and you, exactly. if you look, watch the race on NBCSN, you could see it was almost like somebody grabbed a a, a line of a like a Twizzler, like those peel apart Twizzlers, and the tire just slowly unraveled at about a half an inch to a quarter of an inch. I believe that was off, off the, the 88 car, wasn't it? Yeah, he was the first one to have a tire problem. I, what, it was a Johnson or Truex that also had an issue. Like they, I think it was Truex that felt it, and so he came down pit road. And and his had started to unravel. Yeah, I think that was true, X. But uh, like I say, you got down to the end of the race, and Carl got in front. And Carl had a good car all day. Just yeah. he wasn't able to pass anybody. Right. And for some reason, this track, this race developed like that. And we haven't seen that all year. But, yeah, and, uh, and they're talking about repave for two different reasons. One of them was the reason why we had a six-hour pre-race show was because the weepers. The well, in the condition of the track, the style of the track. You talk about a track like Kentucky. I think they they talked about it on the on the broadcast. A track like Kentucky that's a new repave. I mean, it's what we've ran two races on that new repave. The the chemical I, I and I can't think of the word that that is in between the aggregate that fills in the gaps. The it's almost like the asphalt. You know the there's the rocks and then there's the the glue that holds it all together. Mm -hmm. That is a clean surface, but at Texas it's much more worn, and so the there's a lot of area for the water to stay into. And it took NASCAR a long time to clean that track, and so now they're talking about maybe it's time for a repave. Because this track just, I mean, it took way too long to clean that track off. We should have been racing at about 4 o'clock that afternoon, local time. Well, when they opened that speedway um, back in the mid-90s, they had tons of trouble with water seepage coming up through the track. That track has always had that issue. California Speedway has that issue. Mm. Uh, it was something with the design and the tracks that were built during that you know mid, mid-90s time. But, uh, yeah, I think they could fin could fix that with a repave. Yeah, and, and you're not talking about, uh, like, what we see repave when they repave the interstates where they, they buzz like an inch or two inches off the top oh, of the Oh, no, concrete. they'll take it down to dirt and start over. They got to tear it all out because you can't just put a layer of new surface down. It's, there's a, there's, it, it's talking with Pat Warren, it's very interesting to understand how complex those concrete, chemicals the 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 mixture of it i mean it's like baking a cake you you've got to get the mixture just right and it results in this racing if you do it this way it results in this type and then there's also you got to make sure and get the compound right for the the conditions year round for the weather that kansas has to have a certain style of track as opposed to homestead miami yeah, it's all concrete, but it's a different formula because they don't have the harsh winters and the harsh summers like we have. Well, see, Kansas Speedway is not made out of concrete, just pit road. It's made out of asphalt. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and that's because of the temperature. Yeah. You can have the concrete track in, at Homestead. You mm -hmm. can't have that up here. So Carl Edwards gets the win on a range-shortened race. Talk to me real quick. we got a little bit of time, so we're not cutting too much into turn four. The decision to end that race what well, was a 40, 50, 60 laps early on NASCAR. Good call or bad call? Uh, the only call to make. Okay. The only call to make. Um, obviously, there's teams that don't agree with that, mm -hmm. you know, but. Second on back didn't like it. <laughs> well, and actually, there were guys probably 10th on back that were like, man, I'm glad this day's over. Yeah. They were probably throwing a party later, but the fans had been through a bunch. Mm -hmm. They there weren't any fans to start with. I mean, the the crowd was terrible. When the flag dropped, when the green flag actually dropped, I mean, the stands were empty. But I, I've had a couple of people ask me about this that that this week. You cannot take that as the crowd. Typically, that Texas race, the fall Texas race, is packed, and that's a good selling race for Texas Motor Speedway. But a lot of fans had to go home. They had flights that night at nine or ten o'clock, or they had to they had to they had to drive home to get ready to go to work the next day. They could not have the leisure of hanging around. Whereas you saw, there were some fans that anticipated that. Well, and the ones that still had to get up at six o'clock and go to work on Monday, but were still dedicated and said, "I bought this damn ticket. I'm going to watch a race." Mm -hmm. They were probably glad that they went ahead and called it when it Absolutely. started raining again because they didn't want to sit there for another four or five hours while they dried the track. Exactly. Just like we went back and talked about, it took so long to dry at the first time there was still still storm set to, to hit this hit the track that night i don't know if it ever did but if you're looking at the radar and there's more chance coming you don't want to keep people around for four in front of the two three hours and then have it downpour or even sprinkle and then you got to call the race because you've now caused another issue i think it was the right call to make well and the crowds now i mean i don't know how many people they had i don't know how many tickets they sold but they haven't they haven't had people sitting on that back stretch for probably five years yeah it's and when yeah. i went there my very first trip down to texas in 99 there was not a seat you mm -hmm. you couldn't get up and walk down 10 rows or up 12 rows because you wanted to see a better seat yeah. 
part of the problem with that speedway, as opposed to some of these newer tracks like Kansas and Kentucky, Texas Speedway's got their main aisle. I don't remember if it's uh, in the in the main grandstand. I don't remember if the section divides at row 28 or row 32. But I was sitting in row 17, and I couldn't see the back straightaway. Yeah. And when you go to Kansas, you can sit in row one right behind the fence, and you see the back straightaway because they've got the infield sunk down. Yeah. So you can see over all the people camped out in the infield. Now, we've been in at the Texas, infield. Texas, you don't. Right. At, at Texas, Texas, it does not. Don't. Okay. Correct. So you've got to be up. Like I said, I don't remember if it was row 28 or, or row 32 because I was only in the stands once, but I did walk up there. And I go, okay, if I ever buy tickets up here again, I got, I know I want them up this high. Yeah. You know, before I was thinking I want to be as close as possible. I was just, I had good seats for the mm-hmm. dog legs and everything. They came right at me out of turns three and four and then went right away from me. I was like six sections over towards turn one from the start finish line. It was excellent seats. I could watch the chassis move. It was really nice mm. and good view of pit road, but I couldn't see the back straight away. Wow. Joey Logano, Martin Trux Jr., Chase Elliott, Kyle Busch round out your top five. Kevin Harvick, Matt Kenseth, Casey Kane, Denny Hamlin, and Ryan Newman round out your te- top ten. Before we break, I want to point out one thing that's really critical and something that we're going to have to pay attention to for next year's Pick'em's Contest. A couple of people took Jimmy Johnson expecting him to kind of put his throat on the rest of the field this week and really push for a win. But what we ended up seeing was that he didn't really push that hard. If the opportunity would have arisen, I think he would have pushed hard. But what really hurt a lot of people was that on when, when the rain was coming, he came down pit road and thought, I got nothing to lose. Doesn't matter where I finish. I'm going to get four fresh tires. And if we go back to green, I'm sitting pretty. And we saw that with a couple of different drivers. So you got to keep those wild card things in mind. Yeah, they may not have anything to lose. So they may hang it out there and, and go for the win. But they also may not hang it out there if they have nothing to lose because they're in the round weather regardless. Well, and one thing that that doesn't really cross your mind, and I don't know if this was something in Jimmy's head, but Texas is probably one of the top three or four tracks speed-wise for that type of track. Mm-hmm. I mean, Atlanta is very fast, and then Texas, and you've seen some very spectacular crashes at Texas. You saw Matt Benedetto, if you watched the Xfinity race Saturday, he bounced it into the wall, cutting a tire down, going into turn three, and ends up where he couldn't race Sunday because of the concussion protocol yeah. list. Nobody wanted to, especially Jimmy, since he's in the final four already, he wasn't going to take that chance. He wasn't going to risk anything and possibly not be racing at Homestead. we got to take a break. We'll come back in turn number two. Joe Orth will join us, who's a photographer in the dirt world. We'll talk about his challenges in the Instagram world. Still to come, Ralph Woodard from Uncle Frank's, and we'll preview Phoenix. We'll be back here on the front stretch. Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs has taken a page out of IMCA's rulebook and gone crate. These brand new low emission engines will still have you white knuckling it all through the Metro's fastest indoor facility. Joe's Karting is now friendly for all skill levels with their brand new Honda powered engines. It's time to get to Joe's today and find out what drivers like Jack Dover, Shaylee Bate, and Andrew Kosiski have known for years. Located in Council Bluffs and online at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. We're hooked up in Turn two and still showing the green flag on the front stretch. Welcome back to the front stretch, heading into turn number two, and it's time to talk to uh, a legend in the area. You're, you're, I don't know if you've you've made big waves in the world of, of racing. I, I know that I see you at races a lot, and and everybody I've talked to has said you got to get Joe on the show. He's done. He's seen everything. He's done everything. He's a fixture in this sport. Joe Orth joining us now, photographer for the area, an adamant race fan. How you doing, bud? I'm doing good. It's been way too long since we've been able to get you on the show. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. You know, we've been trying to get up here over, over, probably <laughs> over the last year, year and yep. a half. Talk to me about how it got started. You've been involved in racing for a long time. You were a fan or got started as a crewman, driver? How did it get all, the well, whole get started? Actually, we were over here in Council Bluffs. I was nine years old. And uh, we were seeing my aunt and uncle up visiting for the weekend and Playland Park. My dad and uh, my uncle took me over to there and it was a figure eight race. And from there on, I was hooked. Were you born and raised here? I was born in Lincoln. Excuse me. I was born in Seattle, Washington. Okay. My dad was working for one of the aircraft places there after the war. Okay. uh, And uh, came back here uh, and spent my whole life back here. Did he grow up here and move? He grew up here in Wilbur. So that's how you came back to this area was your dad came home after the, Mm -hmm. after that, probably that. That job ended and, and made his way back? Yes. A figure eight race is a long distance from sprint cars, light models, stock cars, oval racing. How did that connection happen? Well, it, it was the race there. I was mm-hmm. fascinated uh, by the races, plus they had a, a roller coaster. Oh, yeah. So that's why for a nine-year-old. The wild rat. Yep. We, you know, I was nine years old. I yeah. didn't see anything like this. Mm-hmm. So when we went back home, 
we had Lincoln Speedway, Capitol Beach. Mm -hmm. And those were the uh, sedans and, and coupes and everything. And hey, that was great. Well, my dad wasn't really interested in racing. And my folks got a divorce around that time, uh, 60s, 59, 60, 61. They got divorced and back together a couple times. Um, uh, and I was... I was going out there on my own. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have money, I'd climb up in the tree and turn one. <laughs> <laughs> so then it went from fan. How did you get involved in racing? Because we were sharing stories off the air and you were talking about actually crewing for a couple of guys. How long until you became a crewman? Well, it was a 70. It was actually 71 when, when I got back from the service. And uh, a couple friends of mine were working with Lonnie Jensen and Larry Swanson. Larry Swanson was the owner of the Sprint Car Number Fourteen, and he'd he'd been uh, he had a car out probably for the last six seven years at that time with Beckman driving uh, some other drivers in there and doing quite being quite successful. And I kind of I got back in in May of seventy one from uh, the service overseas uh, and brought it bought a, a nice camera back with me and I wanted to take pictures. Um, I took a few pictures that year. The next year I got on the crew with my friends and, uh, we went out and we did pretty good. We won the Eagle championship, the Knoxville championship and the BCRA championship out of Colorado. Mm -hmm. well, I said, Hey, how easy is this? This is great. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, we, we were running second in the nationals and got passed by Billy Schumann on the, I think it was the next to last lap or the, a couple laps, uh, toward the end. Mm -hmm. And we should have been running second. Wow. And, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Opperman won that year. Real quick, you're time in the service what were you what branch i was in the army got okay. drafted in uh september 11th 1969 okay i uh, went over to vietnam spent my whole time in vietnam uh, did the cambodian invasion in may uh they, they and you were a combat soldier you, you kinda... i was in artillery okay so we we fired the guns okay uh and we went over into uh cambodia in, in may of 70 and spent a month over there shooting after uh, shooting out, shooting in different directions of wherever they needed us. <laughs> yeah, not, you, I like how you said that you weren't shooting at the enemy; you were shooting in different directions. Well, <laughs> we went in, and they uh, had a 15 mile limit. They finally put on us. No kidding. And so we couldn't go any further. Yeah. So they backed us off to the border so that we could shoot any way there was okay. and, and everything. And it, it was quite an experience because the B-52s dropped bombs at night. And the next day we'd drive around the craters and uh, go on further down the road. And uh, the NVA was right there. Uh, the, the unit that we supported had actually uh, run into them uh, mm -hmm. in, in a firefight on the road. Uh, they passed each other in convoy and they realized that they were North, North Vietnamese. And... Uh, uh, and then it was U.S. Army, and they turned around and had a firefight. How long were you over there? Uh, actually, about 15 months. I extended okay. over there, so I, when I came home, I didn't have to go to another duty station. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, first off. I, 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 I always like to, to focus on the Vietnam vets because I've, I've been a history buff nearly all my life. My grandpa was a World War II vet, and of all the soldiers coming home, you guys got treated the worst. And I think we, we as a society need to do a lot of making up forever to say thank you because there's so many things that we did for the Korean War vets, World War One, World War Two, the Gulf War vets. Those guys get treated so well when they came back. You guys didn't didn't get the nicest of treatment when you came home. The only thing that could have made this whole story better is if he just said Marines because today's their birthday, doing a oh, yeah. birth birthday for the Marines, yeah. and tomorrow's yeah. Veterans Day. So again, thank you for your service. That that brings up a funny thing when we when we, they were going through the draft line, mm -hmm. the kid in front of me. They, uh, the lady looked at his orders, and she says, you're going to be a Marine. And the sergeant came over, and he says, I want to find that other Marine in here. And he looked at my orders, and he says, okay. Went to the kid next to me, and he was a Marine. So I was in the middle between two Marines they were looking for. Did they just randomly pick him? Randomly picked him. Uh, the sergeant came out. There was probably about 15 or 16 of us, and he said, uh, anybody want to be a Marine here? Huh. And I, everybody looked at the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's and that's a special breed of American that goes up into the Marines. Those guys are crazy. Yeah, those guys are you know, a good kind. We, yeah, we it's a good crazy. Right, but uh, right. as we always said over there in, in over in Vietnam, is the Marines would charge the hill, we'd sit back and bomb it, mm -hmm. so and wait for everything to happen, then go up and charge up. <laughs> it was an interesting thing for a, a twenty-one year old. You mentioned that when you came back, you had a camera with you. Did you take a lot of pictures while you were over there? I took a few. Uh, I've got out photo albums. I've mm -hmm. got books. Uh, the, the nicest thing about it was uh, one place I was stationed, we had a photo lab. Really? So we could do eight by ten black and whites. Um, just had a ball doing that. Um, Is that where you got the, the photography bug? Is that where you kind of got started? Actually, it was drag racing in the late 60s. Okay. My mom had a Instamatic with a winder on top. Okay. And I used to come up to Omaha to airport. Okay. Wire airport. Yeah, really? Well, in the airport before Cornhusker or, or Flightline. Now, Flightline is... Flightland was the 
Airport. Airport. Okay, went yeah. up there, shot everything up there with my little instamatic through the pits and everything. Little red wagon. I've got mm-hmm. a sequence where he did his wheelie thing. Of course, they're pretty small in that little thing. You couldn't <laughs> zoom anything, and it wouldn't let us anywhere close. But uh, that was where I really started that uh, okay. with the camera, and then bought a uh, uh, what they called a. Uh, it was a reflex camera over there, not not the SLR uh, that I ended up coming home with, but I uh, bought a real nice camera and had to pick it up in Japan because there was some trade things. It was it was a Ash Pentex versus a Honeywell, mm-hmm. and you couldn't bring it, you couldn't send it into the states. You had to hand carry it in. Okay, so it was fun. I picked it up in Japan. That was fun. And so you came back and started doing the photography, and you crewing still a little bit too. Yep. You were talking about. At what point did you stop the crewing and, and just kind of start being a, a big fan of, of taking f- photography? Well, f- pictures. Every time that. Our car was out. I'd run down in the infield and take pictures. And then when our car came in, I ran it back up and we worked on the car, basically. And it was taking pictures in, in for uh, the fun of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure wish I'd have taken more, but <laughs> that that's the way it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a lot of black and white back then. Color was just coming in. Uh, color was experimental almost. Uh, you didn't go any above anything 100 ISO uh, so, uh, uh, at that time because it just didn't come out very well yeah and it, it color would have been more expensive too right color was more expensive that's that's the difference between today and uh, today and then yeah is you knew that you had to go develop this stuff in order to look at it so it, it made the serious guy serious and the mm-hmm. other other guys just showed up once in a while i'm always fascinated by the collapse of kodak because it happened so fast it went I, I was a salesman at sears when i first moved up to this area in 2001 and uh, 2002 time and we sold probably the last batch of real digital cameras and within probably three four years Kodak was gone I mean it's mm-hmm. it's I think it's been purchased by several different companies it, it may have altered into different avenues but you don't see it I mean just the camera phone just killed it and so now it's the only camera industry left is high-end cameras yes yes and those are kind of your two three hundred dollar cameras but the stuff you have is a little bit more because you've got to have that exposure rate the the flat the quick quickness to catch the cars going by there's a lot of good cameras out there. You can buy a $2,000 camera that, that, if you know anything about uh, photography, you can get by with something like that. Uh, it doesn't have the ISO that it, it, it needs to do the available light that everybody really likes now. And they do make some nicer cameras for $6,000, which do perform like a $6,000 camera. <laughs> you can get some pretty nice shots with that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. what I've, I, I'm, I'm amazed at the quality that my cell phone can, can get. Yes. When I'm sitting yeah. at the pits at I-80 and I'm just taking a couple of panoramic shots or I'm doing some different stuff, I'm always amazed at the quality of that, but it's nowhere close to what you can do. Uh, no, it, 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 it's, it's very good quality compared to what we had 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, they've come up with so many tricks to everything uh, about that, the uh, vibration, anti-vibration systems and everything. The cell phone takes great pictures mm-hmm. used in used by if you know what you're doing um i've seen outstanding pictures of everything and it's so handy you can send it away and everything though when it, when people go to blow it up then then you have some problems then you it. notice the graininess Every, and everything the, yeah yeah i've got a, a an instructor a nikon guy that uh has that figured out um he can shoot raw with hmm. his his uh cell phone I've never got into the digital realm. I've still got just a 35 millimeter, and I mean, I've had it for 30 years now. The biggest thing the way, I any, found when any I got kids serious, out there listening, 35 millimeter means a roll of film. Right. Dirk yeah, I still, still put film in my camera, <laughs> <laughs> and I have to go somewhere to get it developed. And don't take black and white pictures anymore because that's like 40 bucks a roll to get developed. <laughs> yes, but. it's the uh, last year. One of the guys threw up a challenge down at uh, the Chili Bowl, and he said, "I'm going to shoot some." film Mm -hmm. so i broke out a film camera and we kind of did some stuff we had a place down there in tulsa where we could get it developed and it was uh 17 18 bucks a roll wow uh we both we both shot a roll and you know he looked at his and i looked at mine and yeah i was happy with it same thing you know we we used to do you just you don't shoot as many pictures because you 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 pick everything up and you make sure what you get because you got to pay for each one yeah where the digital world is pop 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 pop. you don't (laughs) like three of them you just trash them yeah but the biggest thing that i found in developing my skills with photography was the camera lens. Yes. How oh, important yeah. the lens can be for you. The glass. I mean, you know, a lot of people buy these kit cameras, mm-hmm. and they come with two kit lenses, one one short one and one long one. Well, if you take a look at them, they're plastic normally. <laughs> you want real glass. It, yeah. it, it does get better. I mean, it just makes a better picture all the way around. It's much, because uh, watching how these things are made, it's precision. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I've, I've always wanted to own, like, a Nikon camera, because I know that they're, they're, they're very... It, it, Actually, I should ask you. Nikon is very well respected camera in, in Nikon, the, Canon. Uh, yep. There's some other cameras coming along. Sony, uh, I believe, is owned by um, 
Nikon, okay. and they're developing a mirrorless. Really? And that, that idea, the technology is coming along very much, and I, I think uh, we're going to see more of it. Do you still take roll film, or, do, or do, have you switched to digital, too? It's too hard to find somebody to develop it. Yeah. That's the trouble. Yeah. And it doesn't give you, you can do so much with, with Photoshop, Lightroom, et mm-hmm. cetera. Mm-hmm. You can, it, it's so easy. Yeah. Well, and like I so said, when you, if you take 10 shots and only one of them's worth saving, if you're on film, you've got a third of a roll of film yeah. used. If with the digital, you just erase, 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 trash, 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 right. boom, I got one picture on my memory card. Let's keep shooting. Exactly. I, I found that when my, my dad and I made a trip to Germany, we, we kind of retraced the invasion of Normandy. And mm-hmm. when we went, we had an old <coughs> camera, my mom's old camera. It was a nice couple hundred dollar camera. We took a couple of rolls with us. We had to buy a couple of more. We ended up taking like nine rolls of film. About four or five years later, we went to Washington, D.C., and I took 800 and some odd pictures because like Dirk was just saying, when you... You're standing there for maybe the last time in your life. You're looking at the Washington Monument or the World War II Monument or whatever, and you want to get that picture of the Iowa wreath or whatever, you take five or six different pictures. And for a guy like you, you can adjust the settings and say, well, maybe let me try this and try this and try this. And then you can go home later and remember what you did and, and understand the lighting of it. Well, uh, it, it, the thing with digital is you can look at it immediately. Mm-hmm. Instant gratification, right. we call it. Yeah. <laughs> you look at it, you go, well, that's not right. I'm going to reshoot that. Yeah. I'm going to change this and change that. And that's the most important thing I can say to anybody doing photography is change. Mm -hmm. You've got to change everything. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you exactly the way I'm going to start shooting at when we go out for hot laps. But within minutes, I'm changing things to adjust to what the, what it's giving me. Sun's going down. Sun's, sun's, sun's not Mm -hmm. giving me what I want. Start out at this. And it it just really uh, adjust, adjust, adjust. Talk to me about some of the photos you've taken over the years and you've in, in, in decades that, do you have like a collection of photos that you're that kind of sit in a special award album photos. that that you're really proud of? Well, here's the I have all my negatives and all my oh well all my negatives because I sold so many of the pictures off of of, of the four buys uh, through through uh, the uh, concession there at Eagle. Mm-hmm. But uh, I have all the negatives back to seventy one. Wow! Um, and it's always fun to go through them. I wish I had shot more mm-hmm. and I shot better pictures, but they are what we have. Yeah. Um, uh, I save them all uh, award winning. You find, you find stuff that you really like today Yeah. that back then maybe it wasn't quite the same, but uh, when I go back and look at the stuff in the seventies, uh, Opperman, uh, Bobby Allen, uh, just the who's who of, of who was around at that time, yeah. uh, that Dozier, et cetera. And a nice crisp, sharp picture is award winning to me. We talk a lot about the world changing, and it seems like in my 34 years, I've seen the world change probably 10 times, and I mean night and day change, as to where back in the 40s, the, the 50s, things changed a lot slower. The, the, the technology, the information age, the growth of the human, human race has made things change so quickly that it's... It, it, I completely lost where I was going with that question. <laughs> Son of a gun. Well, the techno- I felt I had a good one there. The technology but. grows so fast. <laughs> yeah. I, I worked for the phone company for 35 and a half years. Mm-hmm. Okay, I started in the 60s. Hey, it was just that simple. We had one, one party, two party, four party, and ten party. Mm-hmm. In the 80s, it went away. We, we cut everything. We got rid of the ten parties, and we, we went to a four party or two party or one party. Uh, and then the regulation came about and you got to own your own phone. Well, that was a whole different thing then. Yeah. And then we, we went on and, and I was installing digital stuff for them and I didn't understand anything. These geeks that wanted a, a second line so they could be on the computer. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, uh, I don't understand any of this. <laughs> and then finally it started, gra- I started grasping some of it around 2000, 2001, but it's the technology. Yep. And we, we can't afford all the technology that they put at us. Yeah. You, you can't buy a phone fast enough. You can't mm-hmm. buy a camera fast enough. Mm-hmm. The only thing that, that stays basically the same is the lenses. They yeah. just don't develop the lenses. I mean, they, they come out with a lot of great lenses, but, you know, 2000 2000 $3,000 for a yeah. lens, and you go, okay, am I going to use that all the time? Is that my go-to lens? I finally remembered where I was going with that. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, That's has that made you change the way that you run the business aspect of your hobby to where you have to now go out there and say, well, yeah, that that's fine. You've got pictures on Facebook that you can do, but this is good quality high definition stuff that, that you could you could print it in a 4x6 or you could print it into a giant poster because it can blow mm-hmm. up to that size. Well, it's it's changed. And and in that I love people who who enjoy photography as much as I do. Mm-hmm. And people that take pictures with their uh, camera phones uh, uh great great mm-hmm. though it's what you do with it 
Mm-hmm. And uh, there are there are some limitations about what you should do with it. And I know everybody posts them up there on, on Facebook, which it's always great to look at pictures. But as, as I, back in the 70s, when I went to school for some photography classes, uh, the teacher told me there, he, he pointed out there's photography and there's snapshots. Mm-hmm. And so much of the stuff that you see up on Facebook is all about snapshots. There's no photography to it. It's all yeah. snapshots. Yeah. Now, there's, there's a little bit uh, of, of stuff up there, but, you know, the ones that make you go, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. The other conversation I wanted to have was the copyright laws for photography <laughs> are really interesting because I come from the music world and I grew up during the whole Napster uh, the Napster fight, which was when an artist creates a song, they have created something similar to uh, when Picasso paints a painting. He 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 has created something. And that for a while there, it was really kind of interesting to see how the federal laws were going to lay out for photography, because there's mm-hmm. you you essentially created that image. But then there's also some copyright conversation about the what's in the image, if it's of a a building or if it's of a car or if it's of a person. Does that subject also own some copyright information? And eventually, the court said, "No, it's it. You've created this. It is your it's your property." Correct. Uh, it, it's it's a real gray area. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the government left it gray, and I always I always refer to back to the music. If you you young kids all know about the music, mm-hmm. and you know the rules there, and it, it applies right here to photography. Now, I can't stop anybody from stealing a picture off of. Facebook, etc. But the, the silly thing about it is when they post it mm-hmm. and they go, ha ha, look at me. You just stole something from somebody. Right. Mm-hmm. It's no different than you downloading an artist's song and them not getting credit and money for it. Right, right. I mean, you, you've you you've got overhead for this stuff. You've got to pay for your cameras and your batteries and, and the trips out to the track and your pit passes and, and all that stuff. I mean, we, we have fun covering this show, but there's expenses that go along with it that our, our sponsors help pay for. Your revenue on your website helps offset a lot of those costs. And and so when you see it on a Facebook page or a Twitter account or, or it's circulating around, you're like, some people could could say, it's just one picture. Don't worry about it. But before you know it, you've lost out on a lot of money. Amongst the photographers in, in, that I know, uh, we talk about that. Uh, a lot of times you see a name splattered across the center of it. That doesn't stop a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I've even gone as far as this picture is not for public display and a couple go-carters put it up on their Facebook. Yeah, I don't have a website. I don't believe in a website. Really? Per se, people don't keep them up, mm-hmm. yeah, and the bottom true. line is it's a website or a smug mug account. Uh, we, you have so many people out there that are tire kickers. They mm-hmm. want to see what did I look like? What did I look like? They don't want to buy anything. They just want to look. Yeah, and that's okay. Fine. I just don't. I don't have the time to put that way. So how do how do drivers get pictures from you? Do they request that you stand in the corner and take it as they're going by, or do you take it and then offer it? Well, since I've been at Eagle for so long. I do have a pretty good uh, customer base there. They know where to go. They know I'm there. Uh, I do everything through the Eagle's Nest, or they contact me, and we fix them up with what they need. Do you do just race photos, or do you do driver profile pictures, graduation pictures, any other kind of stuff, or is it is it do you just stick to your hobby of, of enjoying the racing? Back in the 80s, I, try, I thought, yeah, let's, let's branch out a little bit. I did a couple weddings, and I ran into a situation where the grandmother and the grandfather were divorced, and they would not be in the same room <laughs> together. <laughs> Jeez. And uh, so we had to take every every individual picture separate. And I said, oh, yeah. that's enough. That's enough. That's I hate that part about weddings and mm-hmm. graduations is, okay, time for photos. And I'm like, I'm going back to the buffet line. Yep. yep. Um, you can forget about me being a part of this because it's, it's just, it takes way too long. It's a massive headache. And, and kudos to those photographers that have the patience to put up with it. I did like three weddings and... <laughs> What yeah. he said is just insane. Yeah. Well, back back at the time in the 80s, I also talked to a gentleman up here that was in a group of wedding photographers. And they had somebody that was in charge of it. And they, you know, do it. And he told me a story about they forgot a wedding. And he says, we had to go back and recreate it. We had to rent the tux. We had to rent. Oh. We had to have the people come in. And we had enough people along the aisle to shoot the wedding over. And then we asked everybody from the, the wedding party then anybody else who was there is please let us borrow your negatives. And so they put a photo album together that wow. way. And I'm going, yeah, it, it's the most important. Well, it used to be the most important thing that you could do. Mm-hmm. And I says, you know, I'm just not set up to do that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Uh, it was always fun to do for a friend, but, you know, they were trying to cut costs. And, you know, what about uh, a young person wanting to get involved, getting started in this? I, I've seen personally a lot of my friends that have started photography companies. 
do you help them out and, and kind of give them some pointers if they come to you and say, I want to start a racing photography company? What's some pointers you can give me? Do you, do you help them out with that? Well, if they, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, it, it, all, it all depends if they come with an attitude. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times, you know, hey, look at my pictures. Look at my pictures. Okay, yeah, they're they're snapshots or they're pictures. Show yeah. me something. I mean, yeah. we shoot a lot of that, uh, and it gets to be called uh, portraits. We call them portraits. You know, nice picture of the car, wheels turning, uh, blurred, blurred, and everything. It's a nice portrait, but it's boring. Yeah, that, that's the whole thing about it. Is so many pictures are boring, um, but you do come up with the ones that and that, that really make you think. Oh yeah, this one's great. Look at this and all the action in it. Yeah. What about uh, last topic? I'm sorry. Did you do something? What about your? Did you ever uh, last topic? You, you doing okay? Your your health good? Yeah, my health. You is had good. a little scare earlier this year. We we had a little bladder situation, uh, bladder cancer. Uh, they uh, VA did a uh, surgery, removed part of the bladder, uh, reconnected the right kidney, and uh, and they said it'd be about six months. You're gonna be uh, regrouping. Good. That's th- that. The big C word is. is that, that's that's about as scary as it gets. Yes, it is. Believe me, uh, all year long and everything, and and uh, we uh, it, it hit, hit us quite quite out of the blue uh, that we didn't know anything about it and no symptoms or anything, and all of a sudden they said, "Hey, we got problems." Mm-hmm. So yeah, we yeah. Well, good. My I, mom just had her bladder removed in April, so yeah. and completely removed. So it's an eighty years old. So it's, she's been struggling with it. It's uh, trying to get things going again is uh, a lot more a lot more difficult than you think. You know, you can you can break an arm, you can break break a leg or anything, mm-hmm. but this all has to do with uh, all that stuff. Uh, your your basic body functions. Something you don't see. I lost kidney function two years ago. Yes. So I do yeah. dialysis three times a week. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, believe me. They, uh, I have one kidney that's 12%, and uh, they, they decided to save it. It's kind of a new technology they want to do. They don't want to take everything because. Um, they, they looked at me and they said, you're healthy enough, you're young enough. Uh, when I say young enough, uh, they, uh, they just wanted to save everything they could. So they, they went about it, and I, I'm, I'm happy they did, but, boy, I sure didn't know this journey was going to be like this. Well, I, I think I speak for a lot of people. We enjoy having you around. I've only got to talk to you a couple of times, but I've always enjoyed our conversations. You've always been a great guy and helped me out with stuff. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank we you. We love talking to you. We love to have you on more often. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, have a good off season, and we'll see you in the pits uh, probably in 2017. There we go. <laughs> All right, we'll be back here on the front stretch. Joe's Karting is giving away a Hammerhead ATV to one of its members on December 17th. All you have to do is get to Joe's and do some racing. Purchase a 16-lap Hammerhead race for $20 plus tax and you're in. On December 17th, Joe's will open the registration box and one lucky customer will win a Hammerhead GTS 150 or a Hammerhead Torpedo. Get to joeskarting.com for more details and rules. It's time to get to Joe's Karting and find out what all your friends already know. If you love wings, if you love rings, and all kinds of other tempting things, great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Feather the brake and get back to the gas. Dan and Dirk are headed into turn three on the front stretch. Welcome back to the front stretch, heading into turn number three, and it's time to talk to the man that uh, makes the decision down at Uncle Frank's, Ralph Woodard. How you doing, sir? Hey, we're doing great, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Uh, talk to us about Uncle Frank's. What, what goes on down there, and, and how did you guys get it all started? Well, I, I've been in karting for uh, over 40 years. And, and my, my business partner, Lee Miller, has, has been in karting for probably 30 years. So uh, we're long-time go-karters. Uh, we've been in the sport since we were kids. Uh, honestly, we were probably standing in the right place at the right time, <laughs> and uh, we ended up business owners. Well, that's great. And so you guys make uh, go-karts, dirt track go-karts, right? We do. Uh, we specialize in the oval market here, mainly dirt racing. That's what's popular. Uh in the Midwest, and, and as you travel south and, and get closer to the East Coast, uh, most people that get started in motorsports uh, begin in karting in some way, either as a child or as an adult. And, and from there, it's just kind of a step. It's a, it's a step into possibly uh, another form of motorsports, or it's, or it's something that, that these people do together as a family when they're kids. 
and, and and on the East Coast or the the West Coast, excuse me, that's kind of where Jeff Gordon got his start. And he they those are more of road course racing out there, right? They are. Yeah. A lot of those racetracks are uh, you know a little three quarter or one mile road course with left and right hand turns. And and honestly, that's kind of where karting started when it got going back in the fifties. Uh, oval dirt track racing started around here in the late seventies, and uh, from there it's it's really taken off. Now the uh, the road course carts are are all of those shifter carts, or is that just a separate class for the road courses? The the shifter carts are a separate class. Uh, the the shifter carts are kind of the higher level of that sprint type racing, uh, but there's lots of other classes, support classes where the kids start that are are not a shifter type uh, uh, go kart. Basically, they're all two cycle. Uh, most of the classes are comprised of a of a 100 cc engine with a with a regular centrif- centrifugal clutch on it. And there's there is a lot of classes that I've noticed for the carts. Is it all basically the same chassis, and then the engine size and the components change, or are the chassis different too with the different classes? Chassis are are very similar from from beginning to end, basically from when you know from when you're a kid and you're six six or seven years old and you get in all the way up to the adult classes. The adult classes are considered 16 and up essentially the same go-kart, same wheelbase, same width. Of course, the seat size is different, and the steering column length is different, pedal location is different, and, and all the kids' classes are restricted. They run an intake restrictor uh, grouped into different age groups that slows them down, uh, and they run a little smaller exhaust system to also keep some of the speed down. And then and then I've noticed just the, the handful of kart races that I've attended is everything after that is, like you said, you've got your age brackets, but then you've got weight brackets. We do, and and once you even and even in the in the kids classes, uh, junior one has a typically a medium and a heavy. Junior two has a medium and a heavy. And as you get into the adult classes, you have a light, a medium, and a heavy. And uh, it's an advantage to be a smaller person uh, in karting. The, the people that do well in karting uh, are not are not big people by any means. Uh, there are some heavier weight classes for those that are heavy and want to enjoy the sport, and that's great too. Yeah. That there is an advantage because that's always been the question. I, I've I've wondered about that when you get up into the bigger series, the the uh, the late models and the stock cars and the hobby stocks. The power of the engine will overcome fifty to pounds of weight, but for carts, it won't. Right? That's correct. And uh, really, what happens is if, if you're running a three hundred sixty pound class uh, and you have a smaller driver, you have a real advantage to be able to bolt maybe sixty or seventy pounds of lead on that that a guy that weighs. 60 or 70 pounds more doesn't get to essentially the class the total class weight is the same but being able to place that in different spots is a real advantage and they can they can, they they're free to place the the lead weight anywhere on the cart yes yep any anywhere there's there's really not a lot of rules there 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 are specific areas that we like to put the weight in uh but but typically you can you can do whatever you want there hmm. there's a there's a max there's there's not a maximum weight, but there is a minimum weight. So if the class weight's 360 pounds, uh, you must weigh 360. Of course, you could weigh 380, but uh, you're going to give up 20 pounds to your competitors that might be right at weight. And again, that's where that advantage of being a smaller person. It used to be that way a lot, like I said, in the bigger cars, you know, a full-size stock car or even as far up as NASCAR. But again, um, now, like in NASCAR, all your top three series, is it's the car without the driver. That's right. So it really the not a super big advantage because they've got so much horsepower, but it still is a small advantage to be a smaller driver. Well, and that's really what racing is comprised of: are these little advantages, these little areas where you can be better than your competitor, and and you know, in the long run, in, in a twenty lap race, you know, hopefully that that equals out to half a second, and at the end of the race, you're, uh, you know, you're you're ten, twelve, fifteen cart lengths ahead of everybody else, and uh, that's really what racing's about. Uh, is being able to find that that advantage. Yeah, and that's at any level. Now, I know you uh, have a mobile uh, uh, parts trailer there. Uh, what tracks locally do you service? We we uh, we go to to Little Sunset Speedway, uh, which is down with I eighty Speedway in Greenwood. We go to uh, Mini E Raceway, which is also located with Eagle Raceway down in Eagle, Nebraska. Uh, those are our two closest race tracks. From there. Uh, Cam Raceway has a racetrack out in Hastings. Uh, Blanco, Iowa has a racetrack that runs Bobcat Speedway. And, and those are probably the tracks for us that are local. Those are tracks that we try to get to. Uh, three of the four tracks we service 
almost weekly or, or biweekly. And then there's lots of racetracks in Iowa, uh, Minnesota, Missouri, Kansas, and, and those tracks we don't typically see once a month, but we might venture out to those racetracks maybe once during the, the summer months. We also run in a traveling series here in the Midwest called the Midwest Maxis Series, which is comprised of five weekends, five racetracks in those states that I listed. And, and really what you'll find is uh, the hitters in the area amongst those states will, will converge into a certain racetrack for the weekend. And uh, those, are, those are excellent races. Uh, the entries are high. They'll get anywhere from maybe 350 to 700 entries for a two- or three-day event. That's what we saw this year in 2016. And so th- those are races that people want to go to, and uh, they've been well attended. They really have. Now, do you still uh, – uh, you've got a son racing, don't you? I do. I do. I have an 11-year-old boy, Caleb, and uh, we just finished our fifth year of, of racing. Uh, we're, we're, having, uh, we're having a great time. I, I'm on the other side of the counter, so you know I can see what the attraction is uh, to the folks that come into the shop here and, and do business with us. And it, it's really a family thing when the kids are young like that. And, and that's what the parents really, really like about it. Are you doing any R&D while your son's out there racing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we try. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you want to go and you want to race uh, with your with your son or your daughter. And, and then, of course, we're there for business as well. So, you know, it's, it, it's twofold for us. Uh, and I like that. I, I really do. I like the ability for us to be able to see our customers every week. Uh, they can... You know, we can service them at the racetrack out of our trailer. We can service them here at our shop uh, on North 84th Street. And, uh, you know, they get to see us a lot, and we get to see them a lot, and I think that's good. Now, do you do you just deal chassis for somebody, or are you building your own thing? We quit building chassis in 2008, so we, we distribute uh, three to four different brands. Uh, most of those brands come out of the Carolinas. Uh, that is really the, the hotbed of, of oval dirt track karting, and those are where the manufacturers are found. Uh, reason being they're racing year-round. Uh, they're racing against each other as, as far as manufacturers, and so those of us that are selling the product really kind of reap the benefits of all their hard work, and so when we turn around and, and we provide a chassis to a customer, we know it's something that's that's proven, uh, you know, at that time. So. What about uh, other services you guys provide at Uncle Frank's? Do you do chassis repairs, uh, bending, we, that kind of stuff? Yeah, we do everything. We, you know, we can help a guy that's been in the sport for five years if he's looking to buy, you know, four, five, six sets of tires, uh, you know, something like that, needs an engine rebuild. We can service the person that's never been in the sport. They have a son or a daughter that's seven years old, which is usually kind of the age that I recommend they get started. Uh, and, and from there, you know, we can kind of take them – from the beginning, uh, which is assembling the chassis, scaling the chassis here in-house, building the engines, dynoing the engines, we would assemble the complete unit and then scale it, uh, align it, adjust all the settings that need to be adjusted, your front-end cambers, casters, alignment, those types of things, and and then actually put the driver in the seat, scale it up, and, and really send it out the door uh, ready to go to the racetrack. Where can people get more information on this? If I'm interested in, in getting my own car or getting my kid involved, what's the easiest way to get a hold of Uncle Frank's? Uh, our website's probably the easiest way to find us, uh, unclefranks.com. Uh, we're on the web. We have an Internet store. So we uh, we don't just service this area. We ship all around the country. Uh, you know, obviously in the winter months, karting's not doing much here, so that allows us to, to do business elsewhere. Uh, of course, you can walk into our store. <laughs> We're here Monday through Saturday. Uh, address here is 2417 North 84th Street. And, uh, you know, we, we, we love to help people get started in the sport. Uh, karting is, is a lot of fun. It brings people together, and, uh, and it's enjoyable. It's reasonably low cost. Uh, compared to the other motorsports that are out there. Well, especially if, if uh, you know, a young kid might watch a race once or twice and, you know, boy, I'd really like to try that or something, it's a, uh, a lot easier to go ahead and, and pick up a cart and, you know, give him a shot, you know, go to the races for, for one summer and find out if the kid does like it and if he's got a little bit of natural ability. It's a lot cheaper to do that than to go out and buy a late model when he turns 16. That, that's exactly that, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, at least this here, you're learning you're experiencing a lot of things that would go on once you get into race cars, 
and uh, it just teaches you a lot about the sport of racing. It teaches you a lot about life, and uh, it's, it's just a, a great thing to be involved in. Been talking with Ralph Woodard. You can get more information on Uncle Frank's at ufranks.com or just Google it. They've got great information on getting involved in dirt cart racing, mostly in the Oval area. And uh, looks like you guys have some other uh, stuff you can purchase. Am I seeing a side by side? A little bit of an off road vehicle online there, too? We do a little bit of that. Yeah, that's a little bit of a sideline for us. Uh, that, uh, that's, that's been something that people uh, seem to like if they don't want to be into karting. And not everybody wants to race. Some of these people just want to, just kind of want to enjoy a recreational go kart, and uh, we do we do a little bit of that as well. We do have some excellent races coming up here. I'll mention uh, thank, the weekend after Thanksgiving in Lincoln, Nebraska. There is uh, an event called the Turkey Chase put on yeah. by the by the Kaziskis. That's a three day event: Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, I could come down and watch that, see what the sport's about, check it out, uh, and then uh, December. Uh, right before New Year's, 29th, 30th, and 31st, uh, myself and some others host the Lincoln Cart, the Nebraska Cart Shootout, which is also an indoor event at the same location, Lancaster Event Center. Uh, also an excellent race. Uh, last last two years in a row, we've had almost 500 entries at our event. So, wow. uh been, been a lot of fun. That's huge. Yeah, and uh, we're going to have Anthony Ainsley and Corey Wilson on the show next weekend to get ready for the turkey chase. We'll more than likely have uh, a couple of guys on to get ready for the Great Nebraska Shootout. Uh, Ralph Wooder, do appreciate your time, sir. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Ralph. You too. Take care. Yeah. So once again, you get more information on that, ufranks.com. That's their uh, website, ufranks. It is plural, U-F-R-A-N-K-S.com. Get more information on their services and what they do. And then you can check out all the fun stuff that is all about dirt oval cart racing uh, in uh, coming up in a, uh, what, a couple of weeks for the Turkey Shootout in Lincoln at the Lancaster Event Center and then the Great Nebraska Shootout. Uh, boy, I can't even keep those, those names <laughs> organized because there's so many of them. And if you want some more information, you can just stop in at Uncle Frank's. Uh, Ralph will take a few minutes and talk to you if you have any questions. I mean, literally full service. He said North 84th Street. Where's that? Just just north of Blondo. Walk north of Blondo. Okay. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back at turn number four. Dirk, can you believe it? Phoenix today, Homestead next weekend. What the heck are we going to do? Go to the cart races. (laughs) (laughs) We'll be back here on the front stretch. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows. It's checkers or wreckers as we enter turn four on the front stretch presented by joe's carting and council bluffs just about ready to wrap this baby up rolling into turn number four i want to say a big thank you to joe orth for joining us and ralph woodard from uncle frank's for joining us Uh, really do appreciate those guys taking the time out of their week to have a conversation with us if you missed any part of today's show you can go over to our youtube channel at about 10 a.m this morning we will get the show posted up as well as all of our shows most of our shows about 99 percent of our shows are on the YouTube channel, and you can go back and listen to all our interviews, including the Legends of the Dirt series that we did over the last couple of years. Working on finalizing that list for this year with uh, with Joe and Lee and everybody that contributes to that, and i got to get your opinion on some of the drivers. All right, let's talk about Phoenix. I'm fascinated by Phoenix because Pickham's contest-wise. You mean Kevin wise. Harvick Speedway? Yeah, <laughs> Pickham's contest-wise. Because I think everybody pretty much understands that Kevin's the guy that's probably going to end up winning this race. There could be things that roll out, you know, with the Kevin's got to win this race if he wants a shot at the championship. Absolutely. But the question is, as a Pickham's contestant, do you take Kevin? Because if everybody's taking Kevin, then you can't take Kevin. Or if a majority of the people are taking, if anybody in front of you is taking Kevin, then you almost have to pick somebody else because, well, for the five-week contest, you have to pick somebody else. For the season long, you still have Homestead. It just depends, and I mean literally depends. What what, what do we have? I saw in the email a nine-point spread between first and second. Yeah. That can be made up at Homestead. That's for the season-long contest. You're right. That can be made up at Homestead. So they could both pick Kevin and not have to worry about it. I right. mean, the guy in front, is going to pick Kevin, or if he's not, that's a, a very big issue in my book. And yep. I think the second place guy should pick him too. If you're down, I want to say it was 22 points into third place and like 47 points to fourth place, if I'm not mistaken. 
First place, uh, Chet Stambaugh has a five point, a nine point lead. Jesse Totten is 22 points behind. You're right. Jake Sells, 47 points back. Jeff Benson, 50 points back. And then sixth place, David Wallenberg, uh, 58 points back. If you're 58 points back, hopefully you still have a pick available that, again, Carl Edwards ran real good there in the spring and has won races there before. So that'd be a guy to take and hopefully ride in his momentum wave because that's, I'll tell you right now, Carl's going to go for the win at Phoenix to keep the momentum up and have a two race win streak going into Homestead and give everybody something to think about. Yeah. That's what's on his mind. So he'd be an excellent selection there. I mean, the Bush brothers have both won there, I believe. Oh, here's the bad news. What's that? As far as the contest is concerned, Chet Stambaugh, who's in the lead, cannot take Harvick today at Phoenix. Whoever can take Harvick today, and he can take Edwards, and that's just as good a pick, especially with a nine-point lead. I do believe Harvick will stay within nine points, and it sounds like he's got a pick that he can use in Jimmy Johnson for Homestead, which... Let's face it. He's going to be the odds on favorite, but he's still got that X factor. He's mm-hmm. never had to race there for a win. Yeah. You know, where Carl Edwards has. Yeah. And like I said, I think Carl's going to do everything in his power to win Phoenix and try and go into Homestead with a two race uh, winning streak and really, you know, make everybody think and get yep. in everybody's head. Yep. And keep in mind, going to Homestead, no bonus points at Homestead. No. Nope. It's all about win. Yeah, first, well, second, it's, it's, third, or fourth. Where yep. do you finish on the track? Absolutely. And and it's it, so there's no bonus points, so even if they lead a lap, doesn't matter. It yep. all comes down to uh, where you finish. 40 points is the maximum number of points they will hand out come Homestead's uh, checkered flag. Well, and, and literally, it doesn't make any difference. Mm-hmm. It's... If, if the lead guy out of the four finishes third, he's going to be the champion. Yeah. Well, you know? if, if they'd had bonus points in there and it had been a – because then there was a possibility of a tie or right. even a possibility of, you know, so no bonus points going no. into to next weekend's race. Everybody would have let a lap. Everybody would have stayed out during a pit stop and, and let a lap. Yeah. So that would have made itself. The only bonus points that would have really been available is if somebody led the most laps, and that's three bonus points. So that's like three positions on the track. Right. That's why they take those all away. Right. Uh, shocker here, Harvick is the only active driver to have won in the last four or five races at Phoenix. So it'll be interesting to see. Dale Earnhardt Jr. won this race this time last, last year, year. Uh, but he's obviously not driving. So right. it, it'll be really interesting to see what happens today. And he I, won on a, on a pit strategy deal. I would, I would put 100% of my money on Kevin Harvick. He's good at Phoenix, great at Phoenix, and his back's against the wall. I got Harvick all day today. Oh, yeah. I've got him available. And I mean, even <laughs> though I'm in 21st or yeah. wherever I'm at, I didn't quit. I'm still battling. We thank you, everybody, for joining us today. The race for Phoenix kicks off at 1 o'clock. Coverage on NBC and MRN. Again, at 1 o'clock, green flag scheduled to be at about 1.30. If you want to head down to Quaker Steak and Lube, you can catch all the green flag action on the big screens of Quaker Steak and Lube. We do hope you join us next weekend for the Homestead Viewing Party. Absolutely. This has been The Front Stretch presented by Joe's Carding on AM590, Omaha's ESPN Radio. If you love wings, if you love rings, and all kinds of other tempting things, great times, great food, get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for The Front Stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro Shop, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 100 plus people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team building, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's Carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows.